taking us through what's in store for the rest of the night on BBC Two. It's back now to the man who even Peter Sellers couldn't keep down, Kung Fu Night's host, Bert Kwok. Still to come on Kung Fu Night, a documentary about the passion and pain of the Hong Kong movie industry in Kung Fu fighting. I don't really need a, a storyboard. Whatever environment you give me, you know, I can come up with 50 shots in my head. I think film is magic. It's not a acrobatic act. It's not a stunt act. You know, it's the, it's the, it's the storytelling uh, vehicle. That's followed at a quarter past midnight by Samo Hung in our second film, The Prodigal Son. must face the lie his life has been. <laughs> then, at 1.50, Tim Westwood with the best Kung Fu-inspired hip-hop in Shaolin Beats. Playing yourself, <laughs> playing yourself. <laughs> I don't play. At 2.15, the irrepressible monkey stars in an episode of his classic 70s serial. You do to start with, invading my mountain. Ah, ah. Where's the boss? You once saw before, the heat to an eye. Take me to your leader. We end Kung Fu Night with the film A Touch of Zen at 3 a.m. So the second half of Kung Fu Night lines up like this. Next, it's Kung Fu Fighting. At 12.15, The Prodigal Son. At 1.50, Shaolin Beats. At 2.15, Monkey. And finally, at 3, A Touch of Zen. So that's Kung Fu Night through the night. Now on Kung Fu Night, we go behind the scenes of the Hong Kong film industry. The karate punch is like an iron bar, whack. A kung fu punch is like an iron chain with an iron ball attached to the end and it go whang and it hurt inside. It's an expression, you know. I think everybody in the world have generally have the same expression, but it's just it takes kung fu movies to deliver that kind of expression from every one of us. <laughs> The action is just superb compared to American films. There, I don't think any other country can beat the Hong Kong people for fights. <laughs> I think everyone would like to be able to walk down the street feeling very confident, and if anything happened, they could deal with it. Most people can't, so they, they live vicariously in the film. As the age becomes more dangerous and more technologically advanced, people feel that they are powerless. There's a sense of looking at a hero who only relies on his hands, his feet, his courage, and his integrity to affect the world around him to an enormous degree. Chinese people, in 
那么所以人很多人喜欢呃看动作电影。To us, it's like fantastic stuff, beautiful movement, so like a ballet dance. Basically, martial arts is a expression of speech. You know, is international physical language. Action movies is uh, can directly uh, give you some message. <laughs> They can understand what they're doing. If you just a drama, uh, I think have some countries people can't understand. Then what? What are you doing? What are you saying? Uh, what are you meaning? The appeal of martial art movies is escapism. You know, I think for Hong Kong people, you've got six million people crowded into this tiny place, and they need a release. You know, we're all living in tiny flats and tower blocks, and they need a release. Particularly for minorities, particularly for people who feel downtrodden, they feel that their lives are controlled by richer people who um, have their own agenda, and they see this underdog hero. And generally, kung fu cinema is the cinema of the underdog. Don't let him go, Ray. Come on. 那么电影来讲，其实不管任何一个社会，呃，我相信都有不公平的事情发生。就是可能有些事情在法律面前。都不是很公平，因为可能很有钱的人可以用律师来解决掉，呃，自己不公，这个自己的对自己不利的事情。可能很多穷人、穷一点的的的的人没办法请律师，很多东西都不公平。即系话咧，就练武，我哋强身健体；练武咧，我哋挫强扶弱，行侠仗义。即系呢个功夫片咧，都有呢个思想性嘅好嘅内涵。黄八根别酒。武术，中国几千年来演变到今天，可以有很好的方法，呃，去提供一种方法，让你锻炼你的身体，使你达到一个健康的目的。所以中国武术，我觉得，呃，它并不需要很，就说你很有钱或者很没有钱都可以做到，或者我有一个。球场，我必须要踢球，我没有球场我踢不了。嗯，其实武术有一块可以站着的地方，已经可以打拳，已经可以锻炼身体。因为我觉得，呃，老人家有老人的方法，年轻人有年轻人的方法。那么中年人有中年人的方法。The different kung fu styles are basically answers to a problem. The problem is, okay, I'm a big fat guy, so I can't do jumping kicks. So what style do I use? Oh well, you're going to use Hong Kun. Well, I'm a light skinny guy, so what can I do? Oh well, you're going to use Wing Chun. Yeah, sir, fight, 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 fight. Wing Chun is originally about. 280 years ago, in the Qin Dynasty, in Wing Chun, we don't use our own brute force to fight. We make use of the force of the enemy. Wing Chun was the style that Bruce Lee learned. It's a very close-range fighting style, and within like the parameters of one's body. Since I start teaching Wing Chun. I have changed uh, my teaching way and make it very modernized. I, I teach them in a very high speed. I learn many different styles, like a Xiu Lam Kun, Shaolin style, a Long Yin Mo Kyu, like a dragon style. I learn so many things. When I teach, I cannot just teach one style. Therefore, I will put all the things I learned together. I create my own style, Zhong Hap Kun. Zhong Hap Kun, it means combination. My disciple, Li Zi Wei, uh, he's uh, 24 years old now. Uh, when his age is eight, he starts to learning Shaolin Kung Fu. 
If you want to be a master of Qigong, the internal power of breathing, you need to really discipline and uh, concentrate on your mind uh, and also keep on training every day, day by day, day by day. It's not for one day you can do it, you know. Traditionally, Kung Fu is believed to have originated from the Shaolin Temple in Hunan Province. This whole story about people inducted into the temple and learning these fighting styles based on the movements of various animals. I myself have doubts because from what I know of the Buddhist tradition, it's basically one of non-violence. <laughs> Temple? Yeah. Yeah. I think what's more likely is that uh, warriors, fighters who had survived the change of dynasty between the Ming dynasty and the Qing would have taken refuge there. So they would have had fighting skills and they would have looked like monks. Kung Fu movies come from one very important origin, the uh, martial art novel, about the hero who have the ability to fight. And the other would be the Chinese opera. The opera more in terms of the participants in the films than in the themes. Many people who came into Kung Fu films had actually been trained as opera players. Like every new year, we have lion dance. You need to train the students or pupils to perform in the street. When we were kids, we really enjoyed seeing those people, you know, making a show in the street by uh, performing a certain school of fighting. 就香港的功夫片呢,就是第一部是1938年的方世玉打擂台. There were a number of movies after the Fong Sai Yuks, and then you had the Wong Fei Hong films, which came into their own in the 50s, starring Quan Tat King as Wong Fei Hong. Jaiakao 就沒有王飛雄電影那麼多姿多彩的。但是王飛雄這個真人呢,都是相當正義的一個人物。He was somebody who really had tremendous strength as a martial arts master, but he used steadfastly only for good, for right, for justice. And you can see that Southern Chinese people need that kind of hero from the fact that he's constantly being reinvented. And you had a very neat changing of the guard, because it was like in, right at the end of the 60s, they did the last black and white Wong Fei Hong film, and suddenly you had films in color with lots of blood and guts, and it shot here in what must be the mecca of uh, Kung Fu film fans, which is the Shaw Brothers studio at Clearwater Bay in Hong Kong. It's a very important landmark in the history of uh, Hong Kong martial arts cinema, in which some of the greatest Kung Fu epics of all time were shot. Shaw Brothers produced over 700 films and must have employed, at one time or other, most of the major talents of Hong Kong cinema. <laughs> Most of the stories are known to Chinese, and we have to make those pictures according to those stories. And of course, we must make it well.
This was a self-contained empire wherein films were produced, the actors were kept on like a campus, the directors were on contract, the craftspeople were on contract, so they had the whole chain. And it was the most perfect filmmaking entity in the history of the industry. <laughs> In the early 70s, Golden Harvest supplanted Shaw's as the number one filmmaking entity in uh, Hong Kong. Raymond Chow, who is the, the main man at Golden Harvest, began his career as a filmmaker as the right-hand man of Run Run Shaw. At a certain point, Raymond Chow realized that he'd rather go out and forge his own empire using some of the skills that he learned from Sir Run Run, and this was a source of great acrimony. The rise of Harvest contributed greatly to the demise of, of Shaw Brothers. The key uh, thing in getting so many people to work with us is that we were the first one to introduce this profit sharing system that is so common in Hollywood or even in European countries. When Bruce Lee came on the scene, he wanted to work at Shaw's. Run on Shaw's said, sure, come and work for us, we'll give you the standard actor's contract and Bruce turned it down, and Raymond Chow said, okay, fine, we'll pay you X, and X percent of the gross. He seek a contract uh, with another studio, uh, but he was not happy with the terms, uh, so he decided to uh, go back to the United States. Well, Bruce and I were very good friends. We worked out together for like three years before he left for Hong Kong to pursue a movie career. And in fact, I met Bruce in New York City when I won the world title in 1968. Bruce was in the audience, and he was doing a television series called The Green Hornet at the time. That legendary nemesis of crime with his loyal companion, Cato. On the eve of his departure, he was on television. And it was a fantastic show. I was so impressed. So uh, I tried to look for him, but he's gone already. But later on, I caught him on the phone and asked him would he would like to come back to work for the Hong Kong film industry. He said that's exactly what he wanted. And I didn't hear from Bruce Lee for like two years. And then out of the clear blue sky, he gives me a call and says, Chuck, I've done two films in Hong Kong and they're really successful. He says, I want to do a fight scene that everyone will remember. And I want to do the fight scene in the Colosseum in Rome and would you be my opponent? We're going to fight to the death. I go, well, who wins? <laughs> He's, I'm the star, I win. <笑><笑>我覺得在這剎那裡看到李小龍 <laughs> 因為李小龍本身是一個世界無術名家 I certainly had a quality about him. I mean, he didn't seem to quite touch the ground. He was sort of tensed on somewhere a few inches off the ground. Of course, he demonstrates his accuracy of <laughs> with a a foot coming past your nose. <laughs> You're standing there and suddenly, whack. Um, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> and you realize that he just put his foot within half an inch of your face and at a, at a very high speed. I guess it was his way of shaking hands, really. Well, Bruce Lee had something that nobody else has, and it's not the fighting, it's the charisma. Just some charisma that you can't acquire. This is Aberdeen Harbour, and it's visible at the beginning of Enter the Dragon when you see the warriors going to the island, embarking on a junk. This is where it actually leaves from. 
This was really an excuse for the filmmakers to show some local colour, because at that time there were many more boats here and many old boats that have since been moved, with many people living on them, some of whom never touched dry land. So they actually got to shoot some wonderful local faces, and it kind of added some texture to an American film being shot in Hong Kong. Behind me, you'll see a big building nestled between high-rises. Those high-rises weren't there in 1973. That was actually the cutaway to denote the castle of Mr. Han, as it was used in the film. Of course, most of the movie was shot in the studios of Golden Harvest over on Hammerhill Road in Kowloon. This is actually one of the rare exterior locations that remains almost exactly as it was in the film itself. As you can see behind me, we have these steps, and it's up these steps that the fighters entering Mr. Han's tournament walk to the tennis courts where the actual fighting took place. Mr. Han's palace was supposedly situated up at the top there. As you can see, these new giant complexes reach up to the sky, and it just shows how quickly places change in Hong Kong. So the it's wonderful crane shot, and you see up through all these tennis courts, all the people punching and everything, and so you see the white lines of the tennis courts on this kind of martial arts tournament arena. We're here now where Kung Fu movie history was made. This is the very site where the finale of Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee was shot in 1973. Gentlemen, let the tournament begin. Mr. Han, played by Seth Geen, will be sitting on a throne just over there. In the old days, this was all just open land. You never knew what, you, what was going to happen. And one day, they actually found a dead body of a woman over there. A woman hiker's dead body was found. Nothing to do with the production, allegedly. So they closed down production while the police came and investigated and interviewed everybody. And all these extras, many of whom were part-time extras and full-time gangsters, were left with a lot of time on their hands. And a bunch of them were sitting on this wall up here when Bruce Lee was teaching one of the other actors how to fight. And of course, after about half an hour in the hot sun, the extras are getting a bit feisty. And some of them were shouting down, ah, oh, you're not as good as you think you are. And they kind of got one guy braver than the others. And he jumped down from the wall to challenge Bruce. Bruce says, you know, well, tell you what, you hit me once, I'll hit you once. So the guy like does a kick and Bruce just deflects it with his shoulder. And then Bruce said, okay, now it's my turn. And he did a kick and it was so fast, the kick hit the guy and the guy thought, Nothing. He didn't think he'd be even hit. And he opened his mouth to laugh at Bruce, and all the teeth and blood fell out. And so that put an end to the challenges, because they figured, no, this guy is way too good. And it happened right here. I guess what impressed me most about Bruce was his focus on what he wanted. He had a vision of what he wanted to accomplish in his life, and he was, he was en route to fulfilling that vision. This fantastic dedication uh, make him, I think, make him so different from other people. He would really go into the movie body and soul. Bruce came into L.A. in 1973, and he had had some problems passing out and so forth, so he came to get a complete physical examination, passed with flying colors. Bruce was 32 at the time, and the doctor said that he had the body of an 18-year-old, and then, of course, Four days later, he dies you know, from, an an from an aneurysm in the brain. Oh, uh, it ranges from uh, sorrow, extreme sorrow for the loss of a great star that every everybody liked, to people who would not believe it. A lot of people thought it was a publicity stunt because he was actually working on a picture called The Game of Death. Even after the funeral, there's still people who won't believe it. Unfortunately, it was true. It was a big shock to the whole industry. This is Bruce Lee's old house at 41 Cumberland Road, Kowloon Tong. It had been claimed, even during Bruce Lee's lifetime, that the house had very bad feng shui, meaning that the way the place was constructed would create bad luck for the owner. And certainly this was borne out by the second occupant, Alexander Fu Seng, another kung fu actor. He too died tragically young in a car crash. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. Subsequently, the house was bought by local triads who turned it into a love motel 
and it's rumoured that senior mainland Chinese diplomats use the facilities with their girlfriends and, of course, their armed bodyguards. Bruce made altogether four films. It was a big loss to the studio, of course, but we carry on with other genre of films uh, until I'm sure you'll come to the next question, would be uh, Jackie Chan. <laughs> Jackie's movie is just uh, entertainment. They arrange all the uh, uh, sensational actions and kung fu fightings for fun. He do this twist and turn in, in the air and very agile. It's like going to an Olympic game, you know? Just doing the twist in the air, land on the ground and waiting for applause. Naturally, in each picture, he would have some very, very difficult and uh, fantastic stunts. But he always uh, put in a lot of comic actions, even in very important fights. As far as technique goes, yeah, I know a lot of people say, well, Bruce Lee was really strong. He could kill you with, you know, one inch punch and this and that. But see, I prefer the Jackie Chan style fighting because it, it, to me, it was a lot more difficult to do all that, a lot more physical. If he hasn't got Bruce's edge, um, you know, um, there's always a time in a Bruce Lee film when, when the, the eyes would get you and, and you think, God, you know, I shouldn't have done that, you know. <laughs> um, whereas with Jackie, there's always a, a bit of a lightness to it. I mean, Jackie's vulnerable. Now, his pictures are guaranteed success virtually all over the world except the big American market. To millions of fans around the world, he's a living legend. Two years ago, when Rumble in the Browns was made, it was picked up in, in America right away and became one of the big hits. So suddenly, uh, he became a really, really uh, a Hollywood star. And the style so, is so energetic and fluid and alive. So that's what makes him so different. After you watch him, you just, you're so impressed. It just blows people away. <laughs> Kung Fu genre as a whole was given a new lease of life by Choi Hark, the director Choi Hark, when he made Once Upon a Time in China with Jet Li, a mainland actor. He'd come onto the scene a few years earlier with a film called Shaolin Temple, but every other movie he'd made hadn't really worked. And he was kind of like an actor in search of a role. And then he found this part in Wong Fei Hong and he suddenly became illuminated. <laughs> The whole thing revolves around the fact that we acknowledge that Jet Li, first of all, is Wong Fei Hong and that he is a martial arts master. Jet Li actually represent China when he was like nine years old or something. And you saw a picture of him like a small kid, you know and uh, shake hand with Nixon, you know, and you know that this guy can, is a very good fighter. Uh, There有很多外国朋友到中国来,我们给他们表演,那我们去到很多国家都要接受电视啊,电影的访问,所以对着镜头我已经习惯了,或者说我在舞台上我去表演我的功夫,我已经习惯了就是说面对观众。当然,在这
do a martial arts, Hong Kong martial arts movie scene is totally different. I mean, you can get anybody and teach them a roundhouse kick and a punch. You know, you could teach anybody in one day how to look like you could fight like that. But the way, what they do in Hong Kong is you have to be a skilled martial artist to be able to perform those moves. You can't fake it. If I was fighting a ring, I don't care about my technique. If I throw a kick like this, okay, bam, I don't care as long as it hits the guy. If I lean out of frame and everything, if you did this in a Hong Kong movie, I'd be out of frame. So in a Hong Kong movie, the emphasis is on looking nice. I'd throw the kick something like this, bam, make it look more powerful, better technique. Some of the times, they want to see what the foreigner can do because the foreigner has come to their country using their skills and their heritage, you've got to prove yourself, you know? And that can be tough. In a boxing ring, the punches would be very short and sharp and sweet this way. In a movie, that wouldn't work. You'd have to make them bigger, bam, 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 boom, more dramatic. You're not fighting like you're really going to kill that person, but you have to be really strong. And uh, I mean, each time I did a movie over there, I thought I was going to die. I thought they were going to kill me. In a real self-defense situation on the street, doing all these advanced high spinning kicks might not be that practical. But for the movie screen, they look great, OK? Here's an example. We're in a studio that was never under 115 degrees, no air conditioning. I lost 18 pounds in weight over that three and a half weeks because you're just fighting all day long. My first movie, I didn't realize that you should wear jackets because you could put pads in there. And I had a sleeveless thing on, so I had to fight everybody bare armed. And I was black and blue all over. <laughs> Sometimes it's really, we cannot control. We really hit the stuntman a little, you know. Devil, they see me, they're scared, you know. <laughs> hey, take it easy. When I made my transition from films, I would hit them a little bit harder, and all the stuntmen were going, ow, ow, and complaining. It's like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, I just came back from Hong Kong because I was used to them saying, Cynthia, more power, more power. <laughs> I think he started half a block away and ran at me and boom, you know, I look like one of those, I always say I look like one of those squids in the water when I go poof, because my legs are out here, my hands are out here, and I'm heading backwards toward the wall. There's some spectacular stunts, you know, I mean, the Kung Fu movies are very spectacular. Of course, there's a lot of injuries and a lot of deaths. I have known many people, uh, they have serious injuries. Uh, for example, they hurt their back, they broken their neck. It is almost guarantee you will get hurt when you shooting as a movie. My counterparts, the bad guys, are uh, always try my size. I fall from first floor window onto second floor, uh, second floor balcony, uh, and then on the ground. Uh, unfortunately, I hurt. Both of my angles. You the explosion started before I jumped. I could smell my hair burn, and by the way down, I reached the ground. My wrist and part of my face are burned. I spent months in the hospital before I recovered. My right shoulder, all the tendons inside are pretty much torn up on an x-ray, and, and the doctors say that the only uh, the only thing that keeping your arms and uh, the rest of my body uh, together is my muscle. It was uh, probably the best training ground for me is to start in Hong Kong. A fight scene in Hong Kong, you might take one month to shoot. In America, they'll say, well, we, we got one day to do it. So there's a big difference there. What they want is total spontaneity. They will write the script as they go. So as an actor, you get the page of dialogue half a minute before you are going to actually shoot it. They will choreograph as they go, which is why the fights do take so long. It's uh, more easy in Hong Kong to make a movie. You may use a mini crew, a student crew. Uh, you may do it in uh, 200 days, may, and you can do it in five days. The States, they're basically with everybody doing their own things, and 
there's no overlapping. Hong Kong, you overlap everything. Sometimes very confusing too, you don't know who's doing what, you know. They film with no sound, and uh, a lot of times, you know, they don't even care what you're saying, so if you make mistakes, it doesn't matter. They wouldn't tell me the camera was running, because you didn't hear action, and you have to learn all these things for yourself. Sometimes I would be looking at the camera, and you know, the cameraman was doing something else, you know. Maybe the cameraman was directing or something. <laughs> I do have some talent when it comes to organizing shots, you know. Whatever environment you give me, you know, I can come up with 50 shots in my head. I think film is magic. It's not a acrobatic act. It's not a stunt act, you know. It's a, it's a, it's a storytelling uh, vehicle. I would look at the whole action sequence, like looking at a music composition, like a whole song. You don't look at one particular section, you look at the whole songs, right? There's a climax, there's a certain flow. I basically have to have all the vision in my head before I go out and shoot it, right? I don't care how many shots and how short the shots are, but the action is still going pretty much simultaneously in the same direction. Once you edit it, the audience would still be able to catch the motion. It would be like, you know, like a flow. I think Hong Kong film is very proud because now the action scenes are constantly changing and making the world have no parallel. Many Chinese directors, they went to Hollywood already and shooting movies with uh, Hollywood stars. But I don't think it's, they call Kung Fu anymore about that. It's action movies. They also have Kung Fu. They also have an um, explosion, gun shooting. All kind of thing, not only Kung Fu. He kind of reached an apotheosis of what you could do with two guys toe to toe, slugging it out for the final reel. And if you look at the Jackie Chan films, I mean, he's moved away from that. And of course, the rest of the industry has followed suit in different directions. We have changed the formula to action comedy for a long time. Action comedy is, seems to be the best genre for us because Hong Kong is so small, Hong Kong relies on exports. In fact, Hong Kong is the second largest film exporting country in the world. In July, Hong Kong will be reverted back to China. Now that's the market. China, because of its population, the demand for better quality pictures is tremendous. Actually,我还是从我拍电影的第一天，嗯，我不知道结果。我拍了电影以后，发现很多人因为电影认识了我，那么我很开心。那我也当时我就想，我希望能够通过，嗯，我继续拍电影，那么继续通过电影把中国的
Please. If he hasn't got Bruce's edge, um, you know, um, there's always a time in a Bruce Lee film when, when the, the eyes would get you and, and you think, God, you know, I shouldn't have done that, you know. <laughs> um, whereas with Jackie, there's always a, a bit of a lightness to it. I mean, Jackie's vulnerable. Now, his pictures are guaranteed success virtually all over the world except the big American market. To millions of fans around the world, he's a living legend. Two years ago, when Rumble in the Browns was made, it was picked up in, in America right away and became one of the big hits. So suddenly, uh, he became a really, really uh, a Hollywood star. Uh, and the style so, is so energetic and fluid and alive. So that's what makes him so different. After you watch him, you just, you're so impressed, it just blows people away. Kung Fu genre as a whole was given a new lease of life by Choi Hark, the director Choi Hark, when he made Once Upon a Time in China with Jet Li, a mainland actor. He'd come onto the scene a few years earlier with a film called Shaolin Temple, but every other movie he'd made hadn't really worked. And he was kind of like an actor in search of a role. And then he found this part in Wong Fei Hong and he suddenly became illuminated. <laughs> The whole thing revolves around the fact that we acknowledge that Jet Li, first of all, is Wong Fei Hong and that he is a martial arts master. Jet Li actually represent China when he was like nine years old or something. And you saw a picture of him like small kid, you know, and uh, shake hand with Nixon, you know. And you know that this guy can, is a very good fighter. Uh, fantastic stunts. But he always uh, put in a lot of comic actions, even in very important fights. As far as technique goes, yeah, I know a lot of people say, well, Bruce Lee was really strong. He could kill you with, you know, one inch punch and this and that. But see, I prefer the Jackie Chan style fighting because it, it, to me, it was a lot more difficult to do all that, a lot more physical. If he hasn't got Bruce's edge, um, you know, um, there's always a time in a Bruce Lee film when, when the, the eyes would get you and, and you think, God, you know, I shouldn't have done that, you know. <laughs> um, whereas with Jackie, there's always a, a bit of a lightness to it. I mean, Jackie's vulnerable. Now, his pictures are guaranteed success virtually all over the world, except the big American market. To millions of fans around the world, he's a living legend. Two years ago, when Rumble in the Browns was made, it was picked up in, in America right away and became one of the big hits. So suddenly, uh, he became a really, really uh, a Hollywood star. And the style so, is so energetic and fluid and alive. So that's what makes him so different. After you watch him, you just, you're so impressed, it just blows people away. Kung Fu genre as a whole was given a new lease of life by Choi Hark, the director Choi Hark, when he made Once Upon a Time in China with Jet Li, a mainland actor. He'd come onto the scene a few years earlier with a film called Shaolin Temple, but every other movie he'd made hadn't really worked. And he was kind of like an actor in search of a role. And then he found this 
part in Wong Fei Hong and he suddenly became illuminated. The whole thing revolves around the fact that we acknowledge that Jet Li, first of all, is Wong Fei Hong and that he is a martial arts master. Jet Li, Many Chinese directors, they went to Hollywood already and shooting movies with uh, Hollywood stars. But I don't think it's, they call Kung Fu anymore, but that is action movies. They also have Kung Fu, they also have um, explosion, gun shooting, all kind of thing. Not only Kung Fu. <laughs> kind of reached an apotheosis of what you could do with two guys toe to toe slugging it out for the final reel and if you look at the Jackie Chan films I mean he's moved away from that and of course the rest of the industry has followed suit in different directions we have changed the formula to action comedy for a long time action comedy is seems to be the best genre for us because Hong Kong is so small Hong Kong relies on exports. In fact, Hong Kong is the second largest film exporting country in the world. In July, Hong Kong will be reverted back to China. Now that's the market. But China, because of its population, the demand for better quality pictures. Tremendous. <laughs> Sometimes very confusing too, you don't know who's doing what, you know. They film with no sound, and uh, a lot of times, you know, they don't even care what you're saying, so if you make mistakes, it doesn't matter. They wouldn't tell me the camera was running, because you didn't hear action, and you have to learn all these things for yourself. Sometime I would be looking at the camera, and you know, the cameraman was doing something else, you know. Maybe the cameraman was directing or something. <laughs> I do have some talent when it comes to organizing shots, you know. Whatever environment you give me, you know, I can come up with 50 shots in my head. I think film is magic. It's not a acrobatic act. It's not a stunt act, you know. It's a, it's a, it's a storytelling uh, vehicle. I would look at the whole action sequence, like looking at a music composition, like a whole song. You don't look at one particular section, you look at the whole songs, right? There was a climax, there's a certain flow. I basically have to have all the vision in my head before I go out and shoot it, right? I don't care how many shots and how short the shots are, but the action is still going pretty much 
simultaneously in the same direction, once you edit it, the audience would still able to catch the motion. It would be like, you know, like a flow. I think... Many Chinese directors, they went to Hollywood already and shooting movies with uh, Hollywood stars. But I don't think it's, they call Kung Fu anymore, but that is action movies. They also have Kung Fu, they also have um, explosion, gun shooting, all kinds of things. Not only Kung Fu. <laughs> kind of reached an apotheosis of what you could do with two guys toe to toe slugging it out for the final reel and if you look at the Jackie Chan films I mean he's moved away from that and of course the rest of the industry has followed suit in different directions we have changed the formula to action comedy for a long time action comedy is seems to be the best genre for us because Hong Kong is so small Hong Kong relies on exports. In fact, Hong Kong is the second largest film exporting country in the world. Live vicariously in the film. As the age becomes more dangerous and more technologically advanced, people feel that they are powerless. There's a sense of looking at a hero who only relies on his hands, his feet, his courage, and his integrity to affect the world around him to an enormous degree. Uh, 身体的表达的方法。那么，所以大家心目中都其实需要英雄。那么动作可以表现出一种英雄的感觉。那么所以人很多人喜欢呃看动作电影。To us, it's like fantastic stuff, beautiful movement, so like a belly dance. Basically, martial arts is a expression of speech. You know. Is international physical language. Action movies is uh, can directly uh, give you some message. <laughs> they can understand what they doing. If uh, you just a drama, uh, I think have some countries people can't understand. Then what? What are you doing? What are you saying? Uh, what are you meaning? And the appeal of martial art movies is escapism. You know, I think for Hong Kong people, you've got six million people crowded into this tiny place and they need a release. You know, we're all living in tiny flats and tower blocks and they need a release. Particularly for minorities, particularly for people who feel downtrodden, they feel that their lives are controlled by richer people who um, have their own agenda and they see this underdog hero. And generally, Kung Fu cinema is the cinema of the underdog. Don't let him go away! Come on! Oh. 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 这个自己的对自己不利的事情中国几千年来演变到今天，可以有很好的方法，呃，去提供一种方法，让你锻炼你的。This is Aberdeen Harbour, and it's visible at the beginning of Enter the Dragon when you see the warriors going to the island, embarking on a junk. This is where it actually leaves from. This was really an excuse for the filmmakers to show some local colour, because at that time there were many more boats here and many old boats that have since been moved. 
with many people living on them, some of whom never touched dry land. So they actually got to shoot some wonderful local faces, and it kind of added some texture to an American film being shot in Hong Kong. Behind me, you'll see a big building it's nestled between high-rises. Those high-rises weren't there in 1973. That was actually the cutaway to denote the castle of Mr. Han, as it was used in the film. Of course, most of the movie was shot in the studios of Golden Harvest over on Hammer Hill Road in Kowloon. This is actually one of the rare exterior locations that remains almost exactly as it was in the film itself. As you can see behind me, we have these steps, and it's up these steps that the fighters entering Mr. Han's tournament walk to the tennis courts where the actual fighting took place. Mr. Han's palace was supposedly situated up at the top there. As you can see, these new giant complexes reach up to the sky and it just shows how quickly places change in Hong Kong. So you get this wonderful crane shot and you see up through all these tennis courts, all the people punching and everything, and so you see the white lines of the tennis courts on this kind of martial arts tournament arena. We're here now where Kung Fu movie history was made. This is the very site where the finale of Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee was shot in 1973. Gentlemen, let the tournament begin. Mr. Han, played by Set Gein, will be sitting on a throne just over there. In the old days, this was all just open land. You never knew what, you, what was going to happen. And one day, they actually found a dead body of a woman over there. A woman hiker's dead body was found. Nothing to do with the production, allegedly. So. They closed down production while the police came and investigated and interviewed everybody. And all these extras, many of whom were part-time extras and full-time gangsters, were left with a lot of time on their hands. And a bunch of them were sitting on this wall up here when Bruce Lee was teaching one of the other actors how to fight. And of course, after about half an hour in the hot sun, the extras are getting a bit feisty. And some of them were shouting down, ah, oh, you're not as good as you think you are. And they kind of got one guy braver than the others. And he jumped down from the wall to challenge Bruce. Bruce says, you know, well, tell you what, you hit me once, I'll hit you once. So the guy like does a kick and Bruce just deflects it with his shoulder. And then Bruce said, okay, now it's my turn. And he did a kick. And it was so fast, the, the studios of Golden Harvest over on Hammer Hill Road in Kowloon. This is actually one of the rare exterior locations that remains almost exactly as it was in the film itself. As you can see behind me, we have these steps, and it's up these steps that the fighters entering Mr. Han's tournament walk to the tennis courts where the actual fighting took place. Mr. Han's palace was supposedly situated up at the top there. As you can see, these new giant complexes reach up to the sky and it just shows how quickly places change in Hong Kong. So you get this wonderful crane shot, and you see up through all these tennis courts, all the people punching and everything, and so you see the white lines of the tennis courts on this kind of martial arts tournament arena. We're here now where Kung Fu movie history was made. This is the very site where the finale of Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee was shot in 1973. Gentlemen, let the tournament begin. Mr. Han, played by Set Gein, will be sitting on a throne just over there. In the old days, this was all just open land. You never knew what, you, what was going to happen. And one day, they actually found a dead body of a woman over there. A woman hiker's dead body was found. Nothing to do with the production, allegedly. So. They closed down production while the police came and investigated and interviewed everybody. And all these extras, many of whom were part-time extras and full-time gangsters, were left with a lot of time on their hands. And a bunch of them were sitting on this wall up here when Bruce Lee was teaching one of the other actors how to fight. And of course, after about half an hour in the hot sun, the extras are getting a bit feisty. And some of them were shouting down, ah, oh, you're not as good as you think you are. And they kind of got one guy braver than the others. And he jumped down from the wall to challenge Bruce. Bruce says, you know, well, tell you what, you hit me once, I'll hit you once. So the guy like does a kick and Bruce just deflects it with his shoulder. And then Bruce said, okay, now it's my turn. And he did a kick and it was so fast, the kick hit the guy and the guy thought, Nothing. He didn't think he'd be even hit. 
and he opened his mouth to laugh at Bruce and all the teeth and blood fell out and so that put an end to the challenges because they figured no the sky is way too good and it happened right here I guess what impressed me most about Bruce was his focus on what he wanted. He had a vision of what he wanted to accomplish in his life, and he was, he was en route to fulfilling that vision. This fantastic dedication uh, make him, I think, make him so different from other people. He would really go into the movie body and soul. Bruce came into L.A. in 1973, and... He was somebody who really had tremendous strength as a martial arts master, but he used steadfastly only for good, for right, for justice. And you can see that Southern Chinese people need that kind of hero from the fact that he's constantly being reinvented. And you had a very neat changing of the guard because it was like in right at the end of the 60s they did the last black and white Wong Fei Hung film and suddenly you had films in color with lots of blood and guts and it shot here in what must be the mecca of uh, kung fu film fans which is the Shaw Brothers studio at Clearwater Bay in Hong Kong it's a very important landmark in the history of uh, Hong Kong martial arts cinema in which some of the greatest kung fu epics of all time were shot Shaw Brothers produced over 700 films and must have employed at one time or other most of the major talents of Hong Kong cinema. Most of the stories are known to Chinese. And we have to make those pictures according to those stories. And of course, we must make it well. This was a self-contained empire wherein films were produced, the actors were kept on like a campus, the directors were on contract, the craftspeople were on contract, so they had the whole chain. And it was the most perfect filmmaking entity in the history of the industry. In the early 70s, Golden Harvest supplanted Shaw's as the number one filmmaking entity in uh, Hong Kong. Raymond Chow, who is the, the main man at Golden Harvest, began his career as a filmmaker as the right-hand man of Run Run Shaw. At a certain point, Raymond Chow realized that he'd rather go out and forge his own empire using some of the skills that he learned from Sir Run Run, and this was a source of great acrimony. The rise of Harvest contributed greatly to the demise of, of Shaw Brothers. The key uh, thing in getting so many people to work with us is that we were the first one to introduce with that practical but for the movie screen they look great okay here's an example we're in a studio that was never under 115 degrees no air conditioning i lost 18 pounds in weight over that three and a half weeks because you're just fighting all day long my first movie, I didn't realize that you should wear jackets because you could put pads in there. And I had a sleeveless thing on, so I had to fight everybody bare-armed. And I was black and blue all over. Sometimes it's really, we cannot control. We really hit the stuntman a little, you know. Whenever they see me, they're scared, you know. Hey, <laughs> take it easy. When I made my transition from films, I would hit them a little bit harder, and all the stuntmen were going, ow, ow, and complaining. It's like, oh, I'm sorry. You know, I just came back from Hong Kong because I was used to them saying, Cynthia, more power, more power. I think he started half a block away and ran at me, and boom, 
You know, I look like one of those, they always say I look like one of those squids in the water when they go poof, because my legs are out here, my hands are out here, and I'm heading backwards toward the wall. There's some spectacular stunts, you know. I mean, the kung fu movies are very spectacular. Of course, there's a lot of injuries and a lot of deaths. I've known many people, uh, they have serious injuries. Uh, for example, they hurt their back, they broken their neck. It is almost guaranteed you will get hurt when you shooting as a movie. My counterparts, the bad guys, uh, always try my size. I fall from first floor window onto second floor, uh, second floor balcony, uh, and then on the ground. Uh, unfortunately, I hurt both of my ankles. You got to go home, you got to go to the little home, man. So, I hope we have a little let you got to go and see. Don't worry, and then home is the gun. I don't like them. I'm going to be able to get a little bit of a job. I don't know. Like, why are you not going to get a little bit of a job? Because you're going to get a little bit of a job. 打落個硬地嗰度，咁啊結果而家咧我個頸椎啦，我腰椎啦都係受咗一個嚴重傷啊 ！The explosion start before I jumped. I could smell my hair burn, and by the way down, I reached the ground. My wrist and part of my face are burned. I spent months in the hospital. Before I recovered, my right shoulder, all the tendons inside are pretty much torn up on an X-ray, and and the doctors say that the only 